All right, ladies and gentlemen, we got through the uh, challenges. I'm out here in Munich right now. I'm in Germany and uh, just got finished off with a couple days of working with the largest, uh, one of the largest companies in Germany and the 34th largest company in the world, Allianz. And uh, we're working very closely with their CEO and their C-suite and helping them uh, with something that we're going to talk about today. How to acknowledge that we're going to be imperfect in our execution, but at the same time to still appear impeccable. We'll see if we can make sure we get uh, all the technical challenges uh, out of the way and, and that nothing slows us down during this presentation. But I will emphasize I'm in Germany on the other side of the world. Our lovely producer Ansley is sitting in our headquarters in Atlanta and I am using uh, the local Wi-Fi here. So hopefully this works out, but I think it'd be a pretty cool presentation based off of the last few days of the interaction that we've done and how we can incorporate that. I am Joel Thorney. That's my call sign. If you followed us in the past, you know that I'm the president of Afterburner. I'm a former F-15 mission commander. I flew presidential escort missions for President Obama and President Bush, and I was an Air Force Academy graduate. Got my MBA from the University of Texas. But more importantly for this group, I took the lessons learned from my experience on elite teams flying an aircraft going two times the speed of sound and uh, you know, flying with a couple of wingmen that you're trying to stop from running into each other or running into that mountain in the cloud. And we, we took those lessons and helped apply them to complex environments in the business world. We've been doing this for 21 years. Our CEO and founder, Jim Murph Murphy, created the, the principles and the roots of our methodology 21 years ago that we continue to iterate upon. Today, we're going to talk about impeccable execution. What does that mean to execute at an impeccable standard? We're going to describe the new standard as being demanded by the marketplace these days. We'll talk about the opportunity that could be there for your teams and your organization. We'll give some examples of some teams that actually are winning the war of appearing impeccable. And then finally, we'll close it out with three steps that we recommend to help your teams maintain that impeccable image. The new standard. Well, folks, if you haven't noticed, things have changed. It used to be that 99%, if you got a score of 99%, if you're like me in uh, high school and someone got a score of 99%, that was an A plus, right? And most of the time that really meant that that person was blowing the curve for the test. Well, that's no longer the case. 99% is not an A plus in the marketplace. Matter of fact, 99%, almost perfect, can be an F. And you're saying, Thor, is that really true? Could that possibly be true? Well, let's talk about some examples. Amazon Web Services recently, you probably saw this, about three weeks ago, had an outage with their main service. Uh, and they had this outage for about four hours. Now, never mind the fact that their uptime, meaning the time that their service has been available, is measured in years, meaning they had consistency for the, the majority of their services for years. But the big story in the Wall Street Journal was not that they had three years of uninterrupted service, it was that they lost service for four hours. And not only that, it affected the stock price. So the market said unequivocally 99%, it was above 99%, it was 99.5% of the time they were available. They said that's not even close to the standard, we expect more of you and we are going to hold you to a higher standard moving forward. United Airlines, if you didn't see this, back in January they had an outage with their IT system. It slowed down flights in terms of uh, their takeoff times. It delayed them. It canceled some flights. It didn't last very long, but once again, it made major news. It was front page news everywhere. And the, the uh, clients, the people that were flying in United Airlines, took to the social media to express their displeasure over this standard, of, over United Airlines not having their uh, system up to speed for a few hours. So if you're, if you're like me, we are all holding the environment to a much higher standard today. And what we're seeing is the emergence of something called the service model. And the best example we can give of this is probably the blockbuster phenomenon where you and I were going out 20 years ago and uh, going to pick up our VHS movies or our DVDs at Blockbuster up until about 2003 or 4. I think everybody did that on a regular basis. And then all of a sudden, Netflix came in and completely upended this model. Yeah. All right, sounds like you guys had lost me for a little bit. Uh, I got notified from my team that uh, he weren't seeing me, so I'm going to back up a bit. 
We talked about how there's an emergence of a service model these days. What we've moved from blockbuster of offering products to offering a service. Netflix, Netflix put Blockbuster out of business because they offered a service that was better than what Blockbuster was offering in terms of a product. We just got done working with Oracle a couple months ago and they said, we're going through the same transition. Very many tech companies are saying we're we are moving from a product-based idea to a service-based revenue model from this point forward. And we, it used to be that we were selling the equivalent of cars and we would get a great upfront uh, sales revenue from that opportunity. We wouldn't see the customer again for a couple of years until they needed a new one. But now it feels like we're selling Uber services because we have to provide services and do that with a smile on our face for a long period of time to be able to retain that customer and retain that, uh, that, that uh, client value. We've got an app for that culture, meaning everything we do, we expect immediate, uh, consistent, high-quality, premium service for that, uh, for that product. If, it's, if it, there's a need for it, there's an app that you can rest assured will be created very quickly. So what's the opportunity for your team? As you look to create an impeccable team, a team that rises to the occasion and meets this new standard, what could take place? Well, you can move from a cost center to a competitive advantage, meaning it's no longer enough just to break even and be a and 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 score near 100% for the market uh, the market value, but also to have a competitive advantage and move from to having a tactical role to having a strategic role within the organization to be more successful. You can help to create agility and innovation if you are able to have that team that that rises to the occasion and is impeccable. I love the example of Amazon uh, because you like. You know, if you bought something on Amazon, they're going to give you suggestions based on your previous purchase history. So not only are they going to give you an impeccable um, performance and an impeccable experience when you get onto their website and you purchase something, but they're going to have an innovative approach to the marketplace and it becomes a competitive advantage for their teams because they're able to do that. And at the same time, you're going to be able to help create an elite team for your organization. So there are teams that are scoring near 100%. We said 99% is enough. So if you want to be held to that impeccable standard, then at least within the marketplace, we need to be near 100% service level. Who are those teams? Well, Google, if you, if you logged on to Google in the past 15 years, chances are the website came up just fine. The search engine worked for you because there's only been about nine minutes in the past 15 years where the Google service was completely unavailable. And, and chances are you didn't try to log in with the, within those nine minutes. So every time we've gone to Google, we just expect it to be available, and it is. And it's because we've worked with Google as well, and we know that internally within their organization, they work very hard at making sure the inevitable, mis inevitable mistakes that take place never make their way to the customers. And another example, I'm not going to tell you the name of this company, um, but uh, we supported a big tech company last year that had an internal quality challenge. And uh, they identified that before it made its way to the marketplace. They had uh, some canaries in the coal mine internally that were saying, you know, this, just, this quality isn't up to the standard that we're used to. We need to address this. We need to be more proactive to fix this. And sure enough, they were able to create a more quality-focused uh, culture within their organization, and they were able to stop some quality challenges in their tracks before they made their way to the marketplace. And here, here's some common themes that are emerging here. We've got teams that have the inevitable mistakes, but still have an impeccable brand and an impeccable reputation within the marketplace because they're able to hold themselves to that high standard and make those mistakes internally and never allow their customers to see them. And I know a little something about operating on an elite team that has to be safe 100% of the time. It wouldn't be enough if my team team and I, when I was a fighter pilot or a trainer pilot, if we were safe for 99% of the time, that's, that wouldn't have been good enough. So we needed to hold ourselves to that impeccably high standard where we're able to make sure that 100% of the time we're safe and effective. And it, you need to give your team the, the ability to make mistakes and to understand that they're going to have uh, the inevitable mistakes take place, but it can never impede their ability to fly effectively or be safe. When I would fly towards the end of my career as an instructor, uh, a lot of the time I'd be paired up with a, a weak student, somebody who wasn't doing that well, and uh, potentially somebody who's doing so poorly that uh, they're getting close to being removed from this program. They're going to stop flying entirely if they have another bad flight. And uh, I was paired up with them because I was a senior instructor and I could provide a little bit more guidance uh, for these individuals who are struggling in the program. And as we're sitting across the table from each other, and the student, you can imagine, is very, very nervous, uh, very uncomfortable. And 
as we're getting to the point where we're getting ready to brief, I always started the briefing the same way. I would say, you will not have a perfect mission today. I will not have a perfect mission today. Matter of fact, I've never had a perfect mission in more than 2,600 missions. I don't expect you to fly perfectly, but I do expect you to fly impeccably. And that means I expect you to make mistakes, but I expect you to adapt and iterate and improve every time you make a mistake. And when the inevitable mistake takes place, I'm assessing your ability to adapt and react with the rest of your team. That's what flawless execution was about to us. It was about making mistakes internally and then stopping them from ever impeding our ability to fly safely or fly effectively. All right, so what are some of the steps we can take to be effective? Number one, you need to define what impeccable is for your teams. Number two, identify the errors and the successes early. And then finally, iterate to create agility. Let's talk about each one of these. Step number one, define impeccable. Teach your team what the new standard is. Identify what the implied promise from the market is. We used the Amazon example earlier. We said that, you know, Amazon obviously, the market obviously expects that Amazon will have near perfect performance. It's not acceptable that they were down for four hours, even though they had years and years of, of uptime and, and, and great service. It wasn't acceptable that for four hours their, their web services were, uh, they had an outage. And it actually affected their stock price. So the market said very clearly, this is what the implied promise is from your team. That's what impeccable means to the market. You need to create what the vision is for success that everybody can be excited about. Because a lot of the time we're telling our team members, hey, I know that 96% has been acceptable for the past 20 years, but we need to raise the bar to 100%. And that's not real exciting to a lot of the teams that we're talking about. We're basically telling them you've got to work harder and, uh, and raise the bar and do more with less. But we've got to tell it to them in terms of why they should be excited about it and what, what that could mean to them if they can actually accomplish this. And, and show the team how, if it's an IT team, that they're going to go from just being a cost center or a, a typical tactical um, group within the organization to a strategic leverage point, to a competitive advantage for the entire company if they're able to raise their game and get near impeccable performance. And then you need to create those clear benchmarks for your team. As you tell them, we need to go from 96% to 100%. You need to show how you're going to be able to take the team along that path in a clear, manageable way that they can see the success opportunities. The common pain points we hear, so this is one we hear all the time. My team doesn't understand that the bar has been raised. For 20 years, 96% was good enough. I've got to have 100% now, and they just aren't accepting that. They're saying, you know, 96% was good enough for many, many years. It shouldn't have to change at this point. We should just be able to be held to that same standard. Well, the team needs to be aware that that standard changed. You need to redefine impeccable for them and let them know that what got, what got the team here is not going to get them to the next level. Once you've defined what impeccable is, next you need to start iterating very quickly and identifying the errors and the successes early. So everybody uh, gloms onto the errors, but it's equally important to identify the successes that we want to create for best practices. And the, way, the best way for us to identify the errors and successes, if you know anything about our methodology, I'm going to say that it comes down to two things, the plan and the debrief. If you have a clear plan and you start off with a clear plan with clear accountability, everyone knows their roles, then it's much easier to debrief it and talk about what went well, what didn't, and how you're going to navigate the inevitable, inevitable pop-up threats that occur during execution. During that debrief conversation, you're going to identify the execution gaps. What's going well? What are the things that we want to scale as a best practice? And then also, what about those gaps? Where are the errors being made? We have permission to make mistakes. Remember, it's okay to make a mistake. But one, we can never let that mistake stop our ability from being impeccable. And two, we can never repeat that mistake. The debrief is the way that we, we identify those errors, find the root cause, and help the, the team to succeed in the future. Next step, iterate to create agility. So it's not about getting the team around one lap of the track and getting them successful on that first attempt or that first project. It's about as quickly as possible iterating and doing it again and again so that the team can learn from their mistakes, learn from the successes, and improve over time. The point is to learn from the past and apply those lessons learned in new plans to be more effective. If you've heard me talk about the training that we did uh, as, as Air Force fighter pilots in the past, what we would do is in a very short period of time, we'd iterate and take somebody who is at uh, zero level, who's never flown an airplane before in their lives, and very quickly take them close to the mastery level, up to that near 100% impeccable flying, 
uh, with our process. The example I give is that we would teach individuals to take off during the day, teach them to take off at night, teach them to fly on instruments when it's cloudy outside and they can't see anything except a couple of instruments that are in front of their face and, and navigate not only around their the local area but take off from Mississippi and fly to California and do that safely. We've got them how to fly loops and barrel rolls and acrobatics within the aircraft. We teach them how to fly low level, which is just a couple hundred feet above the ground, in and out of canyons. And then finally, we teach them how to fly in formation, where you're just three feet away from another aircraft. Not four feet, not two feet, not three feet, or three feet exactly. And they're so close that you can reach out and touch that other wingtip uh, if you're sitting on that wing. And we, it, we're able to teach them all of those things and bring them up to a level where they can do that in an aircraft all by themselves in four months. We're able to do that that quickly, not because we're the world's best instructors or the smartest students, is because we have a process whereby we iterate each time and we take somebody who, who's nowhere near impeccable at the beginning of this program and every day we find new things to improve on, we're very deliberate, we debrief, we identify the lessons learned, and then they apply those lessons learned to that next activity. So if we can do that with somebody who's learning to fly an airplane, I guarantee that you can do that with your teams and apply the same concepts to get them to that impeccable level as well. Translate those lessons learned across the teams. If you find something that's extremely valuable, then make sure you're sharing that with the entire group. Because really, it's not about individual performance, it's about organizational performance and creating a culture that embraces it. As leaders, we want to be able to take our hands off the steering wheel and this is just the new normal. This is just the way things are. We iterate all the time, we have debriefs, and we hold our teams to an impeccable standard. All right, folks, we're going to leave this slide up during the upcoming Q&A. So if you haven't already, I've seen a couple questions come across uh, already, but uh, feel free to jump in that chat box now for Q&A, and I'm going to connect with uh, Anthony, and uh, we'll get those questions sent over to me. So at this point, any questions about how to create an impeccable team, any questions about how we've done this in the past uh, within, with, with other corporations, what challenges come up are fair game. Hi, everyone. Our first question is, how do you manage these rapidly changing expectations of not only customers, but your employees and bosses? So rapidly changing expectations. Here's what I would argue. I would argue that they shouldn't change that much. In other words, you want to create some consistency for your teams and be able to tell them that uh, the long picture, the long-term picture looks like this. Here's our North Star. Here's where we're going as an organization. Ultimately, we want to get to 100%. We want to be able to have a team that operates at that impeccable level, but then back into what the benchmarks are. So if your team members are saying that the, the bar keeps being raised for them, maybe you're not explaining as, as clearly as you could what the long game, the long term picture is. And, and don't just give them the, the quarter picture or the month picture. Say, here's where we're going as an organization. And we always start with the end in mind. We always start with a three year game plan and then back into what that implies we need to do over the next couple of months. Our next question is, how do you manage enforcing the new industry standard within your organization when they are changing so quickly? So how do you enforce the new standard within your organization when they're changing so quickly? Well, first of all, you acknowledge it and you say, look, folks, the, the bar has changed. Your cheese has been moved. We now have a much higher standard. And they all should know this notionally anyway because every single one of us is holding our other clients and, and the, other, uh, the, the other service vendors that we interact with on a personal level. We hold them to a much higher level, right? Do we all expect that? So we just need to tell them it's logical that it's affecting their job as well. That the new market level of premium quality service that we expect personally is going to be expected of their fault uh, at the same time. But the good news is, and the thing that they should be excited about, is that if they're able to achieve this, then that can be a competitive advantage. The IT team is the best example because IT teams, you know, at best they feel like they break even. You know, we have a, they have the mentality that no one ever comes over and pats us on the back when we're doing things right 99.5% of the time, but they sure come over when we have that outage, when we're Amazon Web Services and we got four hours of, of shutdown. They sure will come back at that time and tell us how we're not doing well. But here's the exciting part, the part they should be uh, pumped up about. They're moving from a cost center to a competitive advantage for that organization. 
They're moving from just an operational resource to something that's a strategic resource as they get better and better at their craft because they're going to be part of the tip of the spear, the innovative portion of the organization, and the reason that, that folks are going to want to go with that, uh, that, that vendor versus other ones. Our next question, what is the best way to balance the celebration of successes and management of errors with this new standard? Great question. So I don't balance it. I, in other words, I don't, I, don't, I don't believe that you should try to give as much um, praise as you should uh, give the native comments. I, I believe you should celebrate every success, and sometimes the success is just that we have lessons learned to improve. And so, in other words, after a, a, a poor mission, after things go very badly, sometimes the only thing to celebrate is to say, look, folks, we did a great debrief. We got back together. Look at these lessons learned. We're never going to have something like this take place again because you sat down and you were deliberate and we figured out what the root cause was. We iterated and we pivoted and we're going get, to get better moving forward. Now, in terms of balancing that with the negative feedback, it's all just feedback. It's all telling them the things that we're going to do better in the future because there's always something to do better, and then connecting that back to the strategic progress that we're making as a team. What suggestions do you have to help team members accept that the cheese has moved? Public education environment. Focus there. Public education environment. So I love that one. I did. Um, I, I, I ran a uh, nonprofit for about five years out of San Antonio where we helped out uh, 15,000 kids and helped them to raise their graduation rate uh, during that time frame. Started it uh, with a team in about 2009. And uh, public education world is probably the most challenging place to create an iterative, uh, changing uh, learning environment. Not beyond the learning that takes place in the school, but it's, it's just a challenging environment to get those things because there's so many moving parts between the parents and the kids and the teachers. What I would say is this. Where we were successful is when we had just maniacal focus, just focused like a laser beam on one particular thing. And we said, we're going to make that one particular thing attendance. We believe attendance is the most important thing that we can emphasize. And if we can get the attendance up, that will be the critical leverage point. That will be the leading indicator for success. That will be the rising tide that will float all boats and help the kids to get better at uh, higher grades, that'll help them to have a higher graduation rates, get into college at a higher rate, and we were definitely successful with that, just by having that focus. We wouldn't have been successful if we said, let's simultaneously improve attendance, let's simultaneously connect better with the parents, let's simultaneously get uh, better technology for the kids, because we'd have been spread too thin. We'd have been trying to boil the ocean and it wouldn't have been as effective. So even in an environment as um, potentially challenging and complex as the public education world is, if you have that focus and you can convince the team that based off of this destination that we're collectively pursuing, here's the perfect instrument for us to focus on right now, and you can get a lot accomplished. Can you expand on cost, from cost center to competitive advantage? I'm particularly interested in how to excite the team about this. Yeah, it, this is such an important conversation because this is really the Simon Sinek why portion of it. And, the, you know, when we talk to to one leader, we said, you know, why should we be, why should your team members take on this mission? What is this mission so important for? What, what, you know, they want to get up in the morning and be excited about it. What are we ultimately trying to do? And this leader said, well, we are going to raise our net operating income by 4%. I said, wow, that's horrible. Nobody in the world is getting up early in the morning and excited to work all day for your 4% NOI. I mean, as a CFO, that's exciting. I get it why that's important to you. But you are not motivating me with that conversation. So instead, tell me about the new world we'll be operating where it's not just an NOI is up 4%, but tell me about how now my IT team is on the cutting edge and we have access to all this new technology, access to all these different conversations and a seat at the table because we've proven that not only can we rise to the challenge and meet this impeccable standard, but along the way we inevitably created an elite team that was agile, that had a lot to teach the rest of the organization. And you're gonna you're gonna get that seat at the table, but the only way we do that is if we raise our game from that 96%, our comfort zone where everything feels great right now because we're we're getting the A at 96%, but it's really an F according to the market. If we raise it to that 100%, here it's gonna open a lot of doors for us about some exciting things. That's what you got to sell your team and, and get them to do it to believe in. As an employee, what are the key indicators that I'm adapting in an agile way to the changing market and business rhythm? 
Did it, it, what are the key indicators? So I'll tell you what the key indicators are for me. It's, it's when uh, at an organization, a debrief is not a meeting, it's a culture. And the way you know that's taking place, and whatever you call it, a retrospective, an after action, you know, just that you have a mindset that we're going to always look backwards because we can't afford not to look backwards. The market's changing so fast around us. The worst thing we can do is just wing it at this point and try to, try to get things done the way we've done it for years in the past. So we have to be deliberate. And so you know you've crossed that corner, crossed that threshold when you hear your team members saying, hey, remember that for the debrief. That's a great point. You know, so-and-so will be able to support you. And we got this great lesson learned from the debrief I went to last week. Let me share it with you. That's the cultural threshold that you're trying to meet. And it does take you pushing the team and, and creating that up front. But as soon as you start to hear those comments, you know that you've started to embed that within your organization. And that's when things get really exciting. Because up until that point, it's a lot of hard work on your part as a leader. You're shifting the culture. But you can start to take your hands off the steering wheel at that point and see if the organization is driving itself in a way that you couldn't even drive uh, beforehand. What if the leaders in my organization don't really understand the new reality of 0% tolerance for error? So that's a great opportunity for you to teach them. You need to show them. I mean, I, we, you can show them through um, pretty easily accessible information what the market is expecting. And it, like I said earlier, it comes down to that implied promise. Talk to a few customers. Say, what would your response be if, we, if the following happened? And give them a scenario. And let them see that the world has changed and the, the customer responses and expectations are a lot higher. So we can either just cross our fingers and operate on hope that we never find ourselves in that situation, and inevitably we will because we haven't changed internally, uh, or we can get ahead of that problem like that tech company did that I, that I didn't give a name for that said, hey, we've got some internal um, indications of quality issues that we are seeing right now, and we're going to get ahead of those before they ever make their way to the marketplace. It's not always easy to do because, trust me, your leaders are going to say, I got 20 other urgent things that need me to, to address, that, that I need to address, but you're going to convince them that this is important. If the urgent versus the important, then you're showing them how, in the long term, this is going to be a strategic advantage. It's a great opportunity to teach them and to, and to make a pitch for, for raising the bar. Do you think this also applies to departments within large organizations where social media is a factor? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's everywhere. I think it used to just be that we held just a couple of industries to this insanely high standard, right? I mean, we expected it out of pharma, right? You, get, you wouldn't expect 99% of your aspirins to, you know, have the right ingredients in them or 99% of your, your, your prescriptions to have the right things. We, we're expecting an impeccable level, right, for, for pharma. For the banking industry, it's not okay that they had our, our, our savings account right 99% of the time. We're expecting that 100% level. Automotive safety, same thing. 100% of the time, we need to see them uh, making an effort to keep the, the automa automotive safety uh, emphasis where it should be. But the transition has shifted now to every industry, to every group. It doesn't matter what you're dealing with, and especially in a world where we have social media, where everybody can be a critic, and not just to the critic to the 10 people that they know, but to the entire world on social media. We know how quickly things go viral and, and get out there, especially for an organization that's active in social media. And, and really all of us are at this point, you need to be uh, ready to hold your teams accountable to that impeccable standard. Do you think these increased expectations are also impacting nonprofits and small medium businesses? Yeah, I think because we're, we're just holding everything to a higher standard, I see it happening everywhere. And, and I, I see it as a good thing. And in this conversation, we're talking about it mostly as how it affects us personally when we're held to a higher standard. But how exciting is it that right now you can basically come up with just about any question that a human being knows the answer to? You can go into the internet search and get the answer to that. Now, some of the people on this call, the young people, are like, oh, yeah, of course. But for the people my age, that, that's new. I mean, we didn't have that 15 years ago. If you didn't know the answer to who won the 1952 World Series, you just, you just didn't know until you found the person that, that can remember it or you go, went, went and looked it up in a book or something. But we got that information at our fingertips. So it's great that we have this extremely high level of service and premium quality uh, access now, but the challenge is holding, holding our own teams accountable for it. So I love that we're going this direction. It's only needing more exciting things for the team members that are, are able to raise to that impeccable standard. Can the effects of social media help as much they can, as they can harm an organization? 
I, I definitely think so. We're all over uh, social media in and, and fun and helpful ways and, and sharing information. And I think that's been, that's been a great way to get our, our message up. Personally, I know just at Afterburner, it's been, it's been a great resource and channel for us. Um, and, and obviously, you can hurt as well when, when team members don't hold themselves to the impeccable standard for any organization, that becomes a liability and, uh, and, and a challenge. So it's a, it's a double edged sword. It's, it's both a great resource and, and obviously a threat if we don't hold ourselves to that standard uh, as well. Going back to that, that tech company again, if they, if, I'm confident that if, if they wouldn't have gotten ahead of that quality issue, it would have made its way to customers. We would be hearing about it right now. It would, you just see trickles of it coming out into social media and having issues with uh, some of their products and services. And because they got ahead of it, social media has only been a resource for them because according to their customers, everything's great. And we can take one last question. Okay. In this changing environment, when do you know to identify something as a pop-up threat when it wasn't initially identified as one? So this is a great question, and what it basically amounts to is this, and if I'm reading between the lines of what you're saying, you're saying, as we start to execute, now everything is changing around me so quickly, how do I possibly look at the world around me and identify what's a pop-up threat, what isn't, what are the pop-up threats that are significant enough that I actually need to change a plan for it? And here's what it comes down to for me. It comes down to the work you put into the planning phase. So if you get your key stakeholders together in the planning phase and you spend the time to build that plan, and by the way, it's not a perfect plan because there's no such thing. We're not going to wait for perfect because we're not going to overanalyze and, and, uh, and, and find ourselves in analysis paralysis. We're going to get to the 80% solution. And once we get to the 80% solution, we know one thing, that plan is going to have to change as soon as we start executing in the market. But here's what you've done that's going to help you to execute and, and, and navigate those inevitable pop-up threats. You've built buy-in to your plan. You've built alignment with your team so that when you do run into that first pop-up threat, you're going to hit it. You're going to be able to clearly identify because you're going to say, here's what we said we're going to do. Step number three is now being threatened because of the following. We forgot that spring break is taking place in the first few weeks of April, and everybody, including our customers, are all on vacation. It's going to be really hard to get a hold of them. Our mission is in jeopardy because of that. But as a team, since you've earned the buy-in and the commitment from them, they're willing to navigate it with you and make the effort to, to stay agile at this point and keep the mission on track. So once again, I just want to emphasize that the ability to stay agile during execution, from my perspective, really comes back to how well you plan and then get the team together on, sh on short but frequent intervals to talk about how you're adapting and reacting to those inevitable threats. All right, so Angela, that's it. Uh, as the slide says, if you have any more questions, feel free to reach out to me. I always get about 10 people that, that send a message to me after this and, and have additional questions and want to continue with a specific project. I answer all of those. I love those. Challenge us on some things and say, I'm not quite sure how this would work in my environment or what have you seen here in the past. We've probably seen that challenge and, and we can help you out with it as well. Next up, folks, we are going to be doing a presentation on the, in the next webinar about how to be agile in business. Agile is obviously the word of the decade. We, we've listened to the Allian CEO presentation yesterday uh, with the rest of the team, and it, they said agile probably 20 times. And that's every company that we go to uh, has conversations about how to stay agile. It's because the market's moving faster than ever before, and so leaders are scrambling to try to keep their teams nimble and able to adapt and react. I'm going to be presenting at the Scrum Alliance in April, as well as a couple of PMI events uh, on just this topic. So join us in a month, and we'll talk about uh, how to be agile in your business and really apply this uh, from, from some not only an agile methodology perspective, but across your entire enterprise. Ladies and gentlemen from Germany, thank you for your time. Looking forward to seeing you on the next one. Feel free to reach out to me. Thanks, Anthony. Great job. Thank you.